Hi guys. It is a somewhat gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization down here in the sunshine state of Florida. We have actually made it into February of 2019, but we are going to go up to Chile, right outside of Ottawa, Canada today, where I finally have the great honor and pleasure of speaking to Deb Ozarko, and if you are not familiar with Deb Ozarko's writing about the collapse of the planet and whatnot, I'm just going to, this is what she has to say about why she does and does not write. I don't write for comfort. I don't write to make friends. I don't write to preserve the status quo. I write to rattle cages until the locks fall off. I want to demolish old paradigms. I write to give voice to the voiceless, animals, the earth, and the human soul. I write to make hearts bleed with grief, love, and compassion. I write to shock, anger, irritate, and destroy the ignorance of antiquated belief systems. I write to bring light to the important conversations often swept under the rug. I write to spotlight the cracks in our consciousness that separate us from life. And I think that is a fine introduction. So, uh, <laughs> Deb Ozarko, come on and say hi to the folks, and we're just going to dive right into this conversation. Wow, I have to live up to what I wrote there earlier. That's <laughs> I um, I'd completely forgotten about that. Yeah, that was a stream of consciousness when I wrote that. And um, uh, yeah, I, I don't really care about friends. What I care about is truth more than anything else. So I'm really honored to be here, Sam. All right. Well, speaking of stream of consciousness, here we go. So Deb, for those of us who follow her, she kind of, I guess she kind of disappeared and it was April. Then we did not hear from this woman for months. I, 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 I wrote you, you probably don't even remember blowing me off back in about August. I wrote you and got a very cursory note that you were kind of ju just done with talking about the collapse of the planet. But I'm thrilled to say that uh, Deb has resurfaced you might have, if you read her blog uh, about coming home. So tell us, just just update us. Just where where have you been the last six months? Tell us about just for the next five or six minutes. Try to encapsulate where you have been for the past few months, just to bring people up to date. Well, I was um, I was living out in coastal British Columbia for the last number of years, and that's actually where I honestly had my um the awakening that finally broke through any lingering denial that i had in my anywhere in my body about what's going on in the planet you know being so close to the ocean i was uh you know intimately involved in what was going on every time i was out in my kayak or you know uh out in the canoe with the dogs, I just could not negate what was going on anymore. So that was um, what I was, was there going until... on. Tell us a little bit about what was go what was going on that finally slammed the door on 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 any hope for the for the planet. Well, uh, it started for me. It actually started with these. I'm calling them premonitions, but they were they were very very vivid dreams that I was having in late 2014 about the collapse of the ocean and it got to the point where I was actually feeling haunted and uh, it, it this is before I actually was was seeing anything that was really really noticeable what I was noticing is that when I was out on the water and uh, you know we we my partner and I when the dogs we would stop on the little islands and at low tide we would notice that the tidal pools were pretty lifeless yeah. um, and there were a lot of jellyfish blooms and there were things that we were starting to notice but it wasn't serious enough that it was 
it, it really impacted me. It wasn't until I started having these dreams that I started to really notice that something's really wrong. And that's when I, um, I was inspired to put out, uh, there's an essay that I wrote in early 2015, just to basically get out from within me the stuff that was really haunting me. Like I just felt like if I was, if I was bottling it up, it was, I was, it was, I was drinking poison. Yeah. So I wrote this essay in 2015 and I was actually quite terrified to put it out there. What's the title of it so people can find it on your blog? Um, Do you remember? I think it's it was like the subtitle of my current book, Beyond Hope. It was Letting Go of a World and Collapse, something like that. Um, I can email you the link. Yeah, later. well, that's certainly what the, the main part of this, conver this conversation is, is going to be about. So... You started ha so that was then, and so so what happened particularly this summer? Well, um, I'm just going to back up just a little bit okay. more. What I noticed uh, after I let go of that that essay, there was I had this tsunami of emails that flooded my inbox, and I had no clue that there were so many other people out there who felt the same way and who were um, who were feeling the same level of grief that I was feeling. And so I was, I was really overwhelmed. And that very same summer, so this is in April, I think that I put it out, March or April. And that summer when I was out on the water paddling, um, I was starting to really notice things like there was, I started to notice red tides. Now we never had red tides in, um, you know, in the BC, on the BC coast that yeah. I had seen in all those years. And all of a sudden there they were. Now, I know that you're in Florida right now, so you're probably very familiar with the red tides that have been really plaguing Florida over the last little while. So there was red tides. Then I started to notice uh, these little crabs were just, there was like thousands of them floating dead on the surface of the water. There was that. Um, then not only jellyfish blooms, but I was seeing massive, massive jellyfish die-offs. That We would see dead seals on the shore. Um, it was just, it was endless. And then the following summer, there was this thing that nobody seems to really know what it was, but the ocean turned green. So the normally blue ocean turned this really neon green color. And I actually have photos of it on my website. It was, it was shocking. And so it was, to me, it was just amazing of how quickly what I was dreaming or premonitions, yeah. how that came into reality. It was it, it really shocked me and really rattled me to the core. So those are the, th the sort of things that I was actually experiencing firsthand. And not only that, um, at the same time in 2015, there was a, um, a massive drought on the Sunshine Coast, which is where I was living. And it was so severe that a wildfire broke out basically across the the seashell inlet from where I was living. So I was, I was watching the forest burn right in front of my eyes and it was quite apocalyptic. So it, it, it you know, the, at that time it was like, it's over. I know that it's over. I can feel it in every cell of my body. And there was just no negating it at all anymore. So I completely shifted the focus of my own work, which was basically about, like it just seems ridiculous now about creating hope for a better world and creating a shift in consciousness and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff just seemed, seemed like crap. And I recognized that the hope that I was hanging on to, that I was clinging to for dear life was my way of, of denying what was going on so that I could feel um, a little more ease in my life and not have to fully deal with the grief and the pain that was about to emerge by fully accepting where we were at. But, you know, by finally saying yes to the grief uh, and, and to all of that pain, by moving through that, I come out the other side feeling a lot more empowered and also feeling um, with this sense of acceptance, I'm living my life in a very, very different way. Like I'm not living for a future anymore. I'm living far more presently, and it's amazing how different that mm -hmm. is. So 
so that was that's 2015 and then you know there's there's more but then I moved out to I just started to feel this urge to to come home and for me my birth home geographically is the Ottawa area so I was actually born in Ottawa now I have no interest in actually living in Ottawa anymore because it's turned into a big city and I am not a city person so I'm living on the outskirts in the woods and it's beautiful here still um, <clears throat> but before that my partner wasn't ready to let go of the ocean, so we made a compromise. I knew I needed to move east, and she wasn't ready to let go of the ocean, so we moved out to the Atlantic coast. So we moved out to Nova Scotia. Uh, this that was this past spring, spring of 2018, and what I bore witness to on that coast was even worse than what I bore <laughs> witness to on the Pacific coast. So out of there the frying was even pan into more... the fire, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was um, the thing that shocked me the most is that is the absence of seagulls. There was just there were no seagulls, and I mean, I'm by the ocean. Where the heck are seagulls? They used to be as common as robins, you know. Uh, whenever I'd see those in the spring, so um, I couldn't stand being by the ocean anymore, and finally she reached the point where she couldn't stand it either. And we knew that we needed to come home. And for me, um, home is geographically it's, it's in the Ottawa area, but on a deeper level for me, home really is a state of mind because it's not where I'm at geographically. I don't delude myself into believing that I'm any safer here than anywhere else. What's different here is that I have, intimate connections and relationships with people who really matter to me and they all live in this area and I feel more than more strongly now than ever to be close to the people that mean the most to me so that's where I'm at right now okay so in, in, in that chronology you just gave when, when did you write the book unplug oh wow that one I wrote in um, I think it, it was 2013, yeah, it was 2014. Pre, yeah, well, it, it, it was it, it was pre kind of what you've just been talking about. It was it, it was right yes. right before you went into this phase uh, because it, 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 tell me if I'm misreading this, it sounds to me like it, you're beyond hope which you wrote when just, that's just recent that, that the beyond yeah. hope. Tell, tell me about the released, difference. Sorry, that one I released uh, this just before we left British Columbia to move out to Nova Scotia. So I released that in early. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. So it's not quite a year on that one. Yeah, that's right. But I was writing that for a well. I started writing that shortly after release. I released my essay in um, twenty fifteen. No, was I writing in that in 2014? It's really hard for me to keep uh, track of all this stuff now. But yeah, the unplug was was actually um, it, I think it was the same year that I started having the premonitions, and I was already heading in that direction. I just wasn't ready to fully immerse myself in that intuitive knowing that I had yet. So, so most people would read your your evolution from unplug to beyond hope as a, a darkening of your vision, but I'm not sure you would, but well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Tell us about the, the, the difference in tone and your, and your sense of optimism and whatnot between, between those two books. It sounds to me like that you were still clinging to quite a bit of uh, hope or hopium, whatever you want to call it, in, in your first book, and you've moved beyond that in the second one just absolutely yeah yeah there there was definitely hope in the first book i for me i i have always had a uh a strong connection to my own human spirit and i have always been drawn to that in others so people who live their lives out loud who um who are passionate and compassionate and and just live life with gusto i've always been drawn to that and that really hasn't changed and 
because I surrounded myself with those kind of people, it was easy, a little bit easier for me to, um, to negate what was outside of my bubble. So that doesn't mean that I wasn't aware of what was going on. I was, I just wasn't allowing that fully into my, my bubble of compassion. And when I started having those, those dreams and those, those premonitions, all of a sudden my bubble was burst and it was, nobody burst it. It was just, it was something that was happening inside of me. It was this awareness that was becoming louder to the point where it was like, I I couldn't shut it down. And I didn't want to either because I've always lived my life by my internal guidance. And I know that as my truth. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I know that the world lives with this black, white, dark, light kind of uh, consciousness. I don't see it as a darkening. I see it as as an acceptance of truth. And um, there were definitely times when it felt a lot darker for me because of the grief that came up with all of this and this this letting go of my, my vision for a better world. Um, and then finally fully claiming the truth that I was living inside of me. So yes, that did feel dark. Um, I think that it feels more authentic for me to be speaking this way and to be writing this way because it's, it's where I'm at right now. I mean, I don't believe that we've got much time left now. What that means, I have no clue. I don't know if it's years or months or decades. I have no clue. All I know is that what the way it feels inside of me is that I won't get to live out the natural lifespan of my life because of the collective choices that have been made that have, that are directing the the course of the planet and the way things are unfolding on the planet. So, yeah, um, I um, I've let go of hopium, and I actually uh, going back to that essay that I put out in. 2015 I was called out like I had a podcast and there was a podcast listener who called me out sent me an email and said you know you're you're clinging to hopium and it really irritated me to read that that email but I also knew that deep down there was a truth in it and so um, being called out and and not denying the fact that I was being called out was actually a really huge awakening for me Okay. I just want to read from your from your website that just the the opening sentence from when when you're describing a, about your book Beyond Hope. You start off by saying we have reached the point of no return on planet Earth, where the collective intent for biosphere collapse is manifesting at dizzying speed from widespread social unrest to aggressive threats of nuclear war to pollution soiling every inch of the planet and beyond to mass animal and plant extinction, global overpopulation and runaway biosphere decay. Many powerful forces are converging to create unprecedented chaos and breakdown. Now, you made it clear in your email to me when uh, we were talking about this interview that you that you just didn't want to come on here for a, an hour and and just just repeat the laundry the laundry list that we've all heard. But obviously, mm-hmm. I want you to uh, just so people can know where you are on what I call the Doomer spectrum. Just flesh that out a little bit, uh, a, a little bit uh, for us, just to let us know what you have lost hope about. Um. Well, I um, first of all, I mean, the book is called Beyond Hope. So hope to me is just is no different than wishing. So I mean, there have been many times in my life when I've been wishing for a hundred dollars, but or I mean, I've <laughs> a million dollars, but that never came to fruition. So, um, it's kind of hope to me is really passive, just like wishing is really passive. So I'm not interested in that anymore. Anyway. Um, I understand what you mean about what I've lost hope for. Like, I mean, when I, when you think about it, there are just so many 
converging yeah. crises on this planet. There's just so much crap that's going on that we know about. And I also believe that there is so much that we don't know. And there's also even more that we don't know that we don't know. And that is... It's all unfolding as it's supposed to unfold. Like I've reached a point of acceptance right now where I trust the planet. I totally trust the planet. I mean, for crying out loud, she's been around for billions and billions of years. We as a species have only been around for whatever, thousands of years. So um, I put my money on the planet and I know that whatever whatever happens and however long it takes that she's going to come out okay in the end um because of all of these converging crises i think it's i personally think that it's delusional to believe that we can get through this because this is not a temporary glitch that we can just ride out this is the collapse of the biosphere that sustains life like when you put it all together the biosphere is collapsing and when the biosphere collapses, that's the beginning of the end of life on planet Earth as we know it. And once our systems of comfort start to collapse, and we're seeing that already as, um, you know, just for example, electrical grids are already starting to break down in the heat of Australia and the freezing cold of Chicago. Once all that starts happening, we're going to either freeze or we're going to fry. And the potential for starvation from food store shortages is also beginning to show itself. When you think about the massive die-off of insects and amphibians and fish and birds and now larger mammals, such as the bats and wild horses in Australia, they're already showing us the way. So I know that we're a prolific spe species and we're also a, a resilient species, but we're not infallible. So... Uh, on the Doomer scale, I really do believe that extinction is the path that we have paved for ourselves, just like we've paved it for every other living being on this planet. And um, I, I'm at a point where I'm okay with that, because there's something about having this internal knowing and not denying it that is allowing me to live out whatever time I have left in a way that is even more connected, more compassionate, and um, just less distracted by this toxic civilization that got us into this mess in the first place. Uh, so... Uh... But so when you say we have reached the point of no return on planet Earth, you you are I mean that is your your opening line here. So you, you do one hundred percent believe that. Absolutely, yeah, and and it's not because I'm reading any of the scientific papers and all of that crap out there. For me, it's all entirely based on my internal guidance and also because I spend so much intimate time in the natural world, I'm actually seeing it firsthand. And not only am I seeing it, I'm feeling it. And I'm not shutting any of it down. I'm, I'm looking with eyes wide open. I'm feeling with a wide open heart. And for me, the evidence is, is clear. Yeah, I'm down to say I, the reason one of one of the main reasons I'm taking this trip by uh, this this winter down here is, is literally to visit the Everglades and the Big Cypress Swamp and the mangroves literally while I still can, but before it's gone and and it is just jarring. I feel like I'm just in, a, I mean, it looks kind of, other than the mangroves, which are gone, I mean, it looks kind of the same out the window. I mean, the landscape and the vegetation, but the animals are gone. Yes. They're and gone. See, and I, I think that a lot of people um, are able to still cling to some kind of hope or, or even worse, you know, dig their heels into denial because they're not outside. 
And yeah. when you spend as much time outdoors as I do, like really, really immersed in yeah. the natural world and, and like, like for me, I need to be out in nature as much as I need to breathe just to survive. You know, for me, being in the natural world is life. It's it's um, it's my uh, gate survival. It's like I I really really need that. So because I'm out there so much, and because I am, I'm not just I'm not out there daydreaming. I'm actually in there, really connecting with the natural world. It's that that intimacy is really um, very clear and very telling in the direction that we're going. Like even where I'm living right now, in this beautiful forested area, I I look around now. I, the, the the interesting thing is I lived in this same house 11 years ago, so I actually have um, I have a baseline that I can compare yeah. it to, and. When I look at the forest now compared to the way it was 11 years ago, it looks dry and brittle. And there's also far less birds here than there were 11 years ago. And um, we used to see so much wildlife and there's hardly anything anymore. Like I, I was out on my trails this morning snowshoeing with the dogs and I, um, <clears throat> I came upon a deer carcass which was kind of shocking um, because we, you know, we have this, we have a deer herd that's around here and now there's at least one less. So, um, you know, it's the natural cycle of life that's playing out on this property. And there's a part of me that feels saddened by it, but also I felt a little bit grateful knowing that there's something else out there, probably a coyote or whatever, but I'm not seeing anything like I used to see. I used to see raccoons and wild turkeys and there's just none of that anymore. So, I like that's the kind of thing that to me is um, that doesn't get the headlines like if there's going to be any kind of news about what's going on on the planet. It's the Arctic meltdown that gets all the headlines. And, you know, I'm, I'm far removed from that because of where I live, but I'm not far removed from this splitting polar vortex that has come down um, as a result of the fact that it's warming up in the in the arctic like we've been freezing our asses off here and this is the coldest winter i've ever experienced in my entire 55 years of life in this area but it's warmer uh, north of you pardon me it's warmer at the north pole i think than in ottawa absolutely absolutely and and you know and i've been paying attention to what's been going down in chicago my partner's been telling me that it's even colder there and of course in the other hemisphere, there's um, that massive heat wave that's going mm. on in, in Australia. So, I mean, these are the kind of things that, those are the things that are getting headlines. And what's not getting headlines is this absence of wildlife and birds. And for me, that is far more important and telling about the direction that we're going because this the collapse of ecosystems is the collapse of the web of life. And even though we as a species have removed ourselves from the web of life, we're still part of it. So yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm paying attention to. Now aren't, I assume kind of like me, because a lot of what you're saying, I, I, I you know, you sound, sound a lot like me in my recent uh, videos that I've been making just the past couple of weeks. Sometimes you hit me verbatim and down here in South Florida or Ottawa, Canada, but don't you find on one level now the more time you do get out there and spend in nature that it used to be where you went to 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 get away from your grief and depression and now the more it's on one level the more time that i spend out, out, out in nature the it, it, it doesn't help with the depression in some ways it, it adds to it when yeah. you really start to feel talk about that a minute yeah i can i totally can relate to that so what what um it sounds like you and i are on on parallel paths that way and what i'm what i there's this dissonance between what i can see perceptually and what i'm feeling inside so yeah. i can look outside and i can still see life 
I can still see, you know, the Cardinals and the Blue Jays and, and the Doves that are feeders. And I can see all the beautiful tr- snow-covered trees snowing, and it's gorgeous out there right now. I can see all that, and I can see the beauty. And there's a part of me that can still, to some degree, feel it. But the bigger part of me inside is, is like, I see beauty, and I feel death. Like, it already feels like yeah. it's it's gone. And because when I'm out there, I see how brittle the trees are. And that's from years and years of ongoing drought like they're really starting to suffer so yeah i totally get that um and this summer when i was in nova scotia i it was almost worse for me to go outside because i it, the pain was just too great now also in nova scotia they experienced a heat wave like they've never experienced before so when we were outside it was brutal you could barely breathe and you know it so the thing is it's like so right now I'm experiencing a winter that's colder than I've ever experienced in my entire life and I need to get outside and I go outside and I just feel cold and agitated and and then I come in and I'm I'm there's a part of me that's waiting for spring but yet I know that when spring <laughs> comes it's it's um it's going to be filled with ticks and that's something that's new in Canada that's just this invasion of ticks and you know, the, the big thing around here now, everybody seems to be all freaked out about Lyme disease. Well, they don't seem to realize that this was created by humanity. I mean, we've created these perfect conditions for invasive species like ticks to thrive now. And then, I, and then you know, then winter or summer is going to be so extremely hot that uh, it, it just getting outside is like, once again going to be agitating. So it's this... It, the, the, for me, and I don't know if you understand, well, you probably do understand this, but for me, the planet is starting to feel kind of claustrophobic. Yeah. I, I, Just I, with these yeah, yeah. extremes. So, yeah, well, so it's, obviously, I, I mean, what, what I, what I want to move this conversation to is uh, as more and more people whatever you want to describe it, come down this rabbit hole or come into this knowledge and come into this truth with a capital T and really do wrap their heads and more importantly now their hearts around this and, and truly and truly understand, as I say, on a cellular level that, as you say, we have reached the point of no return that, as you said in this in, in an essay of yours I read a couple of days ago, how we are not going to fix this, that we are not going to somehow renegotiate uh, our entire global industrial civilization over the next... Uh, it, 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 it ain't going to happen. So... If when you do reach that conclusion, the the, the focus of my life and and, and 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 my work really is just a, is just how do you negotiate the rest of your life? How do you comport yourself on this planet when you're carrying around this knowledge that ninety nine point I'd say ninety nine percent at least of the people are are not there with you. What is your advice to to people who are coming into this knowledge? Not to say what I how I call it going Michael Rupert. How do you oh, do it? Yeah, that's um, that's a, a, a an excellent question, and um, you know I don't have the million dollar answer for that one. Uh, for myself, um, what has become most important for me is my own personal evolution. So for me, it's um, becoming as intimate to, with my own essential true nature as possible so that when the time comes for me to choose my own exit and it's not going to be Michael Rupert exit it's going to be a graceful exit then I can do that um, with grace and with with consciousness and, and I can do this it, with with peace as well. Um, now, 
hopefully it won't come to that. But one thing I, I do know is that I am into survive. I'm not into survival. I'm into living. So, and for me, survival is not living. So I'm not one of these prepper types yeah. who's going to be, you know, stocking up on canned beans and <laughs> dried goods and, you know, ammunition and stuff like that. That's, that's exactly the opposite of the way I want to go. If, if anything, what I want is just enough to, um, to, to keep my family and I comfortable until we make the choice to leave on our own in a graceful way. Um, so, you know, there's, I, I'm definitely, uh, I'm in the researching phase of, of that right now because I want to make sure that it is, is done properly and um, peacefully. Um, but before that, like I'm not, I'm not I'm certainly not feeling that now. My, my, my will to live is very strong and I'm still very connected to the natural world and to life despite the, the grief that I do feel about what's going on. I think that the, what's most important for me really is to be present in the meaningful moments in my life that I used to um, overlook or bypass because I was too busy living for a future. And now that I'm no longer living for a future, there's just, there's something about this, uh, this state of presence that has been so, you know, you talk, you, you go to a yoga class and all these, these, uh, new age yogis are always talking about being present when, you know, they're, they're anything but, but what I think what, what really forces you into presence is this awareness. And, um, the other thing that I, in my own life, that's really important to me is to, uh, is to stay involved in my own life as much as possible. So that means that I rarely look outside at what's going on in the world out there. And I say out there in quotation marks, because all it does is cause me more pain. So if I start going down the rabbit hole and reading all the reports and going into the, the news, all the news feeds and stuff like that, it just um, sends me into a tailspin of despair and it doesn't enhance my life. And it certainly doesn't enhance anybody um, in my circle of influence when I'm in that state of despair. So I don't really spend much time looking on the internet to see what's going on out there for me, because I'm so tapped into my, my, my internal world. I already feel it. So I don't need to go out there to bring more pain into my life. So, I, I mean, I, I don't really have the, the magical answer for that. I think that the most important thing is to be committed to, um, to learning more about who you really are so that when the time comes, you can make whatever choice is required to, um, to either leave exit, um, you know, exit in a, a, a graceful way or stay behind in a graceful way. Uh, uh, I think that when we do that consciously, whatever the choice is, then uh, then life is going to be better no matter what. Uh, and, so hopefully and, that answers your question. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, it's going to be well. That that's what I, I mean. The, the the bottom line of of what I do is, is I, don't, I don't think people even understand fifty percent of of my quote mission. And I don't know if you would say the same for yours. Is I, I spend most of my time talking about how bad the situation is, but I but I wrap up every one of my own videos with "Get out there and enjoy it while you still can." And that once you do get beyond hope, you really do find ways to find time and space in your life to get out there. And experience this. Uh, why, why? I mean, it, it, it's a. We we don't know how much longer we have to to experience it. And so, getting it out there and enjoying it while you still can. I'm not. I'm not making a joke. I mean, it's really the only the best advice that I've come up with. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, it's it's like um, 
you know, one of the things that I say is live fully now. And really, um, it, it sounds like a, a cliche, but it, I really do mean that too. Live fully now. Like, stop investing so much energy into a job that you hate. The whole nine to five thing, like, just seems so antiquated to me. I just can't even believe that I ever bought into that at any time in my life now, looking back. But I did. And it got me to where I'm at today. But I'm not there now. So, you know, I mean, just like everybody else, uh, you know, I'm, I am I uh, am uh, captive to this civilization in that I need to eat and I need a roof over my head. I'm not um, resourceful enough in my uh, human domestication that I can fend for myself out there. So there are certain bare comforts that I'm still interested in, like having a roof over my head and, and food in my belly. So there are things that I still need to do to bring in the income to be able to pay for that. But what I, I don't, it's not the focal point of yeah. my life anymore. I'm happy doing a few graphic design jobs here and there. I'm happy when the royalties of my book bring in something that, that helps with the household. Um, you know, uh, my partner and I do farmer's markets. We do little things here and there that actually bring us joy. And I think that that's, that's the most important thing is that as long as we're still uh, captive to this civilization in any way, we're going to make choices that bring us joy. And, and what else can I say? That's part of living fully now. When you say you do farmers, you mean as a seller? Yeah. So my partner makes um, absolutely delicious mustard. So she makes these different flavored mustards and, you know, we'll, uh, she'll sell her books. I'm selling my books. I've got T-shirts. And the nice thing is um, because the stuff that we're creating is stuff that we believe in, stuff that um, that feeds our soul. So when we, when we go to farmer's markets and we offer this stuff, we have the best conversations with people. And... And that is, is something that brings me joy, is having these conversations with people who are interested in our creations. Well, speaking of having conversations with people, uh, and th 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 this is a recurring theme on here, is where do you go? I, I mean, the, obviously the people that find you are, are already down here. Uh, how much of an effort do you make with, with people you meet to, to talk about this subject that nobody wants to do? Do you keep your mouth shut uh, about uh, about all this uh, collapse of the biosphere? How, how do you approach just, just daily deal, dealing with people, not when you're online, you know, talking to people who get it? You know what I'm asking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, here's the thing, Sam. That I'm, I'm always authentic. I mean, whatever, uh, wherever I am, I am always me, and I'm not. I never edit myself. So, um, and I also don't care to convince anybody of something that they don't want to believe yeah. in. So, I'm not. I'm not interested in um, in investing that kind of energy into having a, a a discussion or an argument with somebody who's dug their heels deep into denial. Um, I have no problem. Like for instance, uh, one of my sisters is not interested in talking about it at all. Yeah. And I can still spend time with her and really love being in her company. And so we, we find common ground and we talk about that. I have another sister who's open. And so Whenever there's an opening, I walk right through. I don't ram it down her throat, but I'm just me. I just speak about me. And so she knows where I'm at. Yeah. And I think she understands it on a cognitive level. She just hasn't under, she, she doesn't, she hasn't reached that visceral state like we have yet. And that's cool. I still love spending time with her. I have friends who, um, who know exactly where I'm at. And some of them are open to talking about it. And if, if they are open, then I certainly walk right through that door. And if they're not, once again, we just find common ground and we talk about the things that bring us joy. So 
I don't care to I don't care to convert anybody. I don't care to change anybody. I don't care to teach anybody. I I just want to be I want the platform available for me to be me. And if somebody shuts me down, then I just don't, I'm not interested in hanging out with that kind of a person anyway. So really it's like, it's like you read earlier in, at the beginning of this thing about, I don't write to make friends. Well, I don't live to make friends either. I just live to be me. And, and really that's all there is to it. Okay. Now we've mentioned the word, the word denial has come up, uh, several times in this conversation again this is a recurring theme what what do you make out of these people from donald trump right on down the line who i, I just don't get it anymore how how can anybody are are, are these guys for real are, are are they literally denying it i you know the people i'm talking about the usual list of suspects <laughs> do they really believe their own denial or what, 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 are, what are they thinking? What are they possibly thinking? What, what's your, <laughs> uh, what is your theory on, on what are these idiots possibly thinking right now? Oh, boy. Well, um, obviously, it's baffling to both you and I because, uh, because we just can't seem to go there, and, which is a good thing. I'm really glad that I can't go there. Um, and, and, I mean... It's it's really weird to be awake and aware in a world that is collapsing on a planet that's soon going to be completely uninhabitable and yet still be reliant on a civilization that is completely asleep and living amongst so many people who are completely asleep. Like it's really it's lunacy. And I don't know. Is it a coping mechanism? Perhaps because I. I really do believe that, um, you know, yes, we are hairless bipeds that are different than most animals, but we are still animals. And I, I think that the way we as a species have chosen to live, we've, we've severed our connection to that animal instinct that, uh, that will drive wildlife in Indonesia running up the hill when a tsunami warning is going to come. Like, I think that we, we still have that in us as a species, but because we're so far removed from it, it's, you, you know, we just, we, we can't really hear the whispers from within anymore. So, I don't know. I, I just... Uh, so maybe it is real that we've, do, we've just cut ourselves off so much from our, our natural connection to the earth that we really that way that we that maybe they really are in denial because before you're in denial you have to admit the you know, in this word denial and at first you have to be aware of it and but how could you not be aware of it in, in, anymore it, it 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 just floors me just floors me yeah i get that and i think that you know i i think that one of the things that we fear most as a species is is our deaths for one thing, but I think that even more so, we as a species fear change. And so I think with all of the interconnecting dots of chaos playing out there right now, uh, it's, it, it becomes overwhelming. And perhaps, um, like I said earlier, it's, it's just a, it's a coping mechanism. And to not have to look at that because that would create massive chaos in somebody's body because they would have to change. And with change being so feared, um, it's easier to just dig your heels deeper into the status quo and just maintain business as usual. So I don't know. That's my, that's my uh, theory. That's fly, my fly by the seat of my pants theory right now. And, and what is it? What is it going to take? At, at, at what point do you think that this planet has to get to before people do get it? And I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question. <laughs> by, by the time people and by that this, this this mythical critical mass that I'm always hearing about this critical mass and consciousness. By the is it is there such thing as a critical mass in consciousness in humanity? 
Uh, are we ever going to reach it? And if we do, are we going to reach it in time to pull the to turn the freight train around? Well, we've certainly reached a critical mass in extinction consciousness for sure. <laughs> like we're <laughs> we're like barely down the tracks there. I don't. I think that we've run out of time. I, there's. I think that that's just some hokey new age belief system that I confess to once hoping was true, um, but I I just I cannot see it now. And honestly, is there worse things than having ourselves go extinct so that the earth can finally heal i don't think so like i think it's a i i see it as a good thing now i really do and um human extinction to, or or every earthling we share the planet with extinction well that's yeah that sucks but i you know unfortunately <laughs> i think that's just part of it's part of the way it's all playing out those uh, are the canaries in the coal mine for where we're headed so yeah i think that once we're gone Hallelujah, Earth can finally, finally yeah. breathe a sigh of relief and, and heal. And who knows what's going to come next? I mean, the stories that we've been told by archaeologists about past extinction events show that every time the Earth has had, you know, thousands and millions of years to heal, there's been, uh, you know, more evolved conscious beings that turn up. So I'm... God, at this point, there's got to be something better than us. So we, we've got to go to allow room for that to happen. So uh, you are you are not one of these. And, and, and it, it amazes me how so many people that even that I interview on, even on this channel, uh, j just start from the place that, that modern global industrial civilization is it's just understood it needs to be preserved i mean we just need to tweak it and get rid of the the bad things and and, and save the good things but i don't i don't hear you <laughs> defending uh None of it. no no absolutely not i i the sooner it goes the better and I really do hope that it goes soon. And, you know, these, these, uh, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I see industrial civilization is a, a deeply rooted addiction and it's a psychosis of entitlement. So we can dress it up in green or whatever color as much as we want, <laughs> but the only thing that changes is the color. It's still a toxic civilization, and it's still based on the foundation of consumption. And consumption is the the root of the uh, the separation that has really destroyed this planet. But it's still going to be ugly, uh, Deb. Face it, it, it it's not going to be pleasant. As Gail Zawacki said when I interviewed her that you don't want to be around to witness it. You know, it's, nope. it, it's, it's as much as you might it might be cheering it on, you don't want to be here when this, when you know, when it really comes down. Uh, Absolutely not. No. Uh, no. You know, you, know, you think about these, these prepper guys, you know, the preppers who believe they have an advantage over the rest. <laughs> well, uh, I really do believe that the earth is going to have the last, laugh you know because at the rate that birds and insects and wildlife are dying off there's going to be nothing nothing left for them to murder other than their own neighbors and kids and you know like i said earlier this the species that we are humans the human species is resilient and it's prolific so maybe that works in their favor so to the preppers i say bon appetit and i know that gail zawacki was talking about the the uh, cannibalistic zombies and you know i can see it heading in that direction i do not see the better side of humanity prevailing because we've had thousands of years for it to do so and it's actually gone in the completely opposite direction so yeah my my plan is a graceful exit when i choose not when the zombies come knocking on my door so uh yeah, I, I, I do know it's going to be ugly. It's already starting yeah. to show its like even its its ugliness with every day that passes. It's getting increasingly ugly. You know, like like I said earlier, 
I could barely tolerate the heat from this summer in Nova Scotia. That was unbearable. And then, you know, we were plagued with these, these voracious, this voracious infestation of ticks before that. And now we're just freezing our asses off in the winter time. Like I'm, I don't know how much more I can tolerate of this. And I, I don't know if I want to, I, I just, I do not, I'm not here to survive. I'm here to live and to thrive. And when that is severely compromised, then I'm going to start making some very, very serious conscious choices. And I don't see death as a bad thing. I really just see it as a continuation of, of life. I think that we've just been so conditioned with our, it's not just a culture. It's just, it's, I think it's, it's most cultures. We've been conditioned to believe that death is something to be feared and it's just, it's the end and we should grieve it. And I'm not saying that I don't grieve death and that I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I'm not, but I also see it very differently. Like I see it as a release. I see it as, um, as a liberation. And I don't know what, what's beyond this physical existence of mine. Um, I, I'd like to believe that it's, it's better than this. Um, and there is a part of me that does believe that and is, is excited in some way to discover that, but I don't believe it's an end. So that's why I don't feel the same way that a lot of other people do about preserving this civilization. I want to see it end. I also know it's going to be ugly and I'm not going to hang around for it. And I don't fear my death. So it's, it's just, I'm reaching this. It's, I, I haven't aced it yet, but I'm reaching this place of real peace about all of this. And while at the same time, I am doing what I can to live fully now and enjoy what's left of the natural world. So yeah, it's a very strange place to be. Like I never thought that this would be my life. It's, it's very strange. And I'm sure you can probably agree with uh. how it's hard <laughs> really is that we're even having this conversation it, it, it's, it's a bizarre strange. conversation to be having isn't it uh yeah i would have been trying to sell you a house 10 years ago i, I was a real estate <laughs> agent that's when i was working for keller williams anyway i global industrial civilization is is uh is getting ready to collapse on this camera battery and uh in about two and a half minutes so anyway, as much as this hurts me, I, I think you pretty much just summed up what's usually my last question anyway. So I think, uh, now stick stick around for a minute, but uh, we need okay. to, we need, as much as this hurts me, guys, we need to wrap this up. But you can always go on debozarko, D-E-B-O-Z-A-R-K-O.com and find a whole lot more where this came from. And Debo Zarko, we really appreciate you finding an hour of your time to come talk to us at Collapse Chronicles. And more importantly, we really appreciate the work that you do and keep up the good fight. Thank you, Sam.